this a little disclaimer, but we used uh, some strong language on this podcast this week because we had a lot of feelings. Welcome to the eighth episode of Doika. I'm Stephanie. And I'm Swedian. And this week we have a very special guest, Dea Safina, who became internet famous because she posted historical nude photos of Indonesian women. We're going to talk to her about the motivations for her doing that and what actually went on during those times and the arbitrariness of um, censoring female nipples. Uh, we also talked to Dea about what it's like to be an outspoken woman on the internet and the social cost of doing that. We also talked about how this is not an isolated in or individual incident and how in general data shows that women are more likely to be interrupted and mansplained by other people. And, and we're also going to have Dea talk about the Indonesian feminist scene and how there are awesome organizations made for Indonesian women by Indonesian women. So, here's to it. So, I actually met there a few months ago. No, not really. Yeah, like, I like did. Two weeks ago. No, no, no. That's the first time we actually met. But first time. Uh, okay. But I <laughs> actually, you've seen me. Yeah, though. like so. Uh, we were in uh, Tubuko Autoritasku, and then you gave a talk on the fact that you were bad on Facebook yeah. because you posted new pictures of women in Indonesia. And historical new pictures. Historical new women, and uh-huh. I was telling um, my friend how. Uh, I really want to talk to her because she sounds super awesome, and I was like too shy. And then you escape, and then we met in person in real life a few days ago. Yeah, yeah. So we were in Komnas Prampon, and we are a part of Jakarta Feminist Discussion Group. Mm-hmm. And then, well, I just joined, so I can't really say I'm a part. I of think it. I was the one accepting her. And uh, so we met a while ago, and we were talking about at Anti Kekerasan Prampon, so the new law, like. People are trying to draft on yes. violence against women. So yeah, and we wanted to have her here today to talk about her experiences being a feminist in Indonesia and to share with us some of her experiences. Yeah, so, that's super cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, can you tell us a little bit about what happened leading up to the Facebook thing? Yeah, so, from your perspective. Yeah. From yeah. Perspective. Actually, I was just responding to the censorship that the. Cafe did, but they yeah. said it wasn't the cafe. The cafe, the cafe just did what they were sp- told to do. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I was just responding. Oh yeah, we actually talked about it in our second episode. So the cafe decided to blur out yeah. uh, the. They blurred out cleavage, cleavage mm-hmm. yeah. and ties of the yeah. Miss Indonesia they beauty pageants. Yeah, and like... then this reason was it's sort of oh it's not Indonesian to yeah. be nude or um, yeah. show body parts and you were like no I know. <laughs> so you mm-hmm. dug up um, pictures of women in Indonesian history yeah, actually it's yeah. just not a, it's just not me okay. posting that if you go to um, Facebook groups that uh, let's just say one of the name of the Facebook group was Indonesia Tempo Dulu mm-hmm. mm-hmm. they have a lot of pictures about Indonesian women that were mm-hmm. topless and nothing happened mm-hmm. no one was upset yeah. everyone was cool with it like mm-hmm. okay this is it was the right space to bring that up because yeah. it was Indonesia Tempo Dulu, which means yeah. it was historical. It, it was historical, but was, then yeah. I, what I did was to respond mm-hmm. to the censorship. So the post was where did you find the photos from Indonesia? Tempo Dulu? I just googled it. Yeah, it's just like Indonesian human pictures yeah. of history. It's yeah. just. It's, very, it's not that hard to find them. It's not that hard to yeah. find. It's everywhere. What did you yeah. caption it? I caption it. Okay, this is the real. Yeah, Indonesia. that's that's where the crux of. The, yes, the, this is the real history. This is how women used to dress, and mm-hmm. it was normal at that time. No one felt the need to sexualize them. Yeah. No one felt offended by seeing boobs everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. And then that's when everybody's like, "Whoa!" Whoa! And yeah. I had like almost. 3,000 shares. Oh, wow. really? Yeah, 3,000 shares in just 24, less than 24 hours. But yeah. then, in 24 hours, my Facebook got banned. Yeah. Wow, yeah. That, was, that was quick. That was, that was quick, yeah. That was yeah. quick. Did they give a reason for why it was banned? It's nudity. Mm-hmm. It shows boobs. And 
Well, the thing is, nipples are not allowed. Yeah. Women nipples are not allowed. Boobs are the shape of the boob is allowed. The shape of the boob is allowed, but, but not nipples. Not nipples. Not, nipples. Not, female nipples. not female nipples. Not female nipples. Because I, there's a lot of male nipples out there. Yeah, there are a lot of male nipples, and I think that's that's very strange. Actually, did you know in um, like in the early 1900s, the male nipple was also considered sexual in the West, like sexual and um, impolite to show in public. Mm. And then uh, at some point, the men was you know wanted to be at the beach topless, and it was considered not normal. Wow. It was considered like also profane, and it was also I think this was in England under profanity oh, laws. Oh, probably during Victorian era. Victorian, so Victorian mm-hmm. era. So the men started campaigning to. Do their free version the of the free the nipple. Oh, I and didn't then, know that. Yeah, and then they it's got like because such a huge number of men showed up in droves, like you know, topless. topless. It was finally everyone was <laughs> like, okay, fine, male nipples are fine. So, so it used to be that males also had to cover up, but then mm. they decided to fight censorship mm. laws and then got the freedom. So the idea that um, you know you had to sexualize female nipples is also as everything is, you know, it's something that goes through a cultural process, right? What guys think is something that's standard and yeah. normal is not the case. It's like, you know, it's, a, yeah. it's only a few hundred years old. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm also curious, like, okay, so your, your account was banned yeah. and then there was this, okay. I would say, international sort of like reaction yeah, 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 to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, And then, I guess it got reinstated again. Yes. How long, how long did that take? It was, it was like almost a week. A week? Because they keep activating and then they keep banning again. And Are you serious? <laughs> yes. It's, until I got in touch with someone from inside. Yeah. Oh, ah, okay. okay. That's I can't yeah. go on to the details, yeah. but then, mm-hmm. okay, fine. I agree to uh, not post things. Yeah, yeah. no, not post things. Just mm-hmm. not post anything nipple related. Okay. So. I see. Okay. So it, you were, did they ever ask you personally in like Facebook? To not personally. Or? So, just, so you think what happens? A lot of people reported you, and because yes. a lot of people reported you, you yes. were automatically banned, and then yes. you were recently opened, and people did that again. Yes. Did you ever delete the post in the end? I finally deleted it. Oh, and that that ended the drama. Yes. Yeah. Patriarchy wins. <laughs> interesting is the fact that it was already there in Indonesia Tempo Rulu. Mm-hmm. So it is also the context in which you shared it, which is, you know, anti-censorship and KPI. It became political. So yeah. that became a big part of why it was, one, first of all, shared, and second of all, why it's considered a problem. problem. Issue, yeah. Yeah. When, as long as it's historical, we're just like, oh, everybody can appreciate history. It's history. Yeah, but then once it becomes political, political. or it has even the potential to become political, then it becomes a problem and nobody mm-hmm. wants to actually, wait a minute, we don't want to change anything, we just want to like our past and not think about it. Well, it's what's horrible. What's important as well, the fact that you know, you're pointing out that it's Indonesian history, is because the changing norms, right? Like this mm-hmm. idea that yes. um, if something is cleavish, it's considered Western or like yeah. too yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, foreign or not. In tra- of traditional values. It's not in Indonesia. Yeah, yeah, but that's the thing. Like that's actually it, it stems from the fact that we're we're all Majapahit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The native citizens of Indonesia were all mm-hmm. this Majapahit, and they were all under Hinduism. And yeah. and when Islam came, they had to run, and apparently they went to Bali. Yeah. And that is where their the, the norm of dressing up topless became yeah. a norm there. Yeah. And if you see in the museums and uh, the statues of mm-hmm. old uh, of old kingdoms, yeah. most of them are naked. Most mm-hmm. of them. and that was the norm back then in yeah. Java. And it was true for men and women, right? It's yeah, like, it was just like people dressed the same way Ways. regardless of their genders at the time. Yeah. What is I think also really annoying is you know when they talk about Kim Kardashian and Emily Ratajkowski mm-hmm. Instagram posts of them topless. topless and being fully but naked yeah and mm-hmm. so it's like this, there's this idea if you're sexualizing yourself or a woman is sexualized um, as long as she's not showing her nipples or whatever it's fine but if you are doing something that's true and natural and even if it's not sexual if it's like a woman's body it's considered taboo yeah 
something that's normal to women but yeah. un- unnormal or like not natural to men seems to scare the scare the shit out of them because <laughs> this goes back into like this idea of men needing to control female sexuality yes. and female bodies. female bodies and blaming women for being I think for it's being themselves for being themselves for, be- for, being, for being a person, person. Yeah, for, for being existing, existing. For existing. Yeah. should we all stay at home now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now that you know that whole Facebook thing has happened, uh, what are your thoughts about that experience as, yeah. as somebody who went through it? You know, like seeing the responses of the people who supported you, but also seeing the reaction from Facebook and from maybe some people who didn't support you. Well, there's a lot of response. Mm-hmm. I well, there's a lot of hateful comments. Really? So, yeah, but. You go through it, and I I did go through a phase. Oh, am I doing this wrong? Or yeah. and no, it's there's nothing wrong about it. Yeah. And there's always people gonna hate you for that. Yeah. There's yeah. always people gonna, but it's how we approach them. It's how we teach them about not being ignorant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's it's actually fun to see the response. Yeah. How do the people in your life? My react parents to actually parents? were like crazy. Well, like, what did they you've say? You've got to. So. Uh, is you don't speak up don't try to be vocal like, they were telling mm-hmm. me not to mm-hmm. uh, yeah but, um, I explained to them no I was educating the public yeah mm-hmm. and it has nothing to do with me I think a lot of vocal women can really relate to that idea mm-hmm. like it's very hard to speak up it's it's you have to at least in my experience when I'm trying to speak up I am always way more prepared and way more thoughtful, thoughtful and than your male counterparts. Your male counterparts. <laughs> and somehow, yes. like I have to have that justification ready, and I have to have thought out what I'm going to say. Mm-hmm. Like I'm very grateful for the fact that I have had a very good education. Otherwise, I feel like I would have been a lot less comfortable. And I think there are a lot of women who have a lot of their own experiences, but are just more hesitant to say and share that experience because they don't want to be considered loud or bossy or contrary to the ideal of what mm-hmm. is female, right? Yeah. And it's really sad because all women sh- should have their voices heard, not just the more outspoken and don't give a fuck kind of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. idea that you know you need to acknowledge women's voices is backed up by data (laughs) data guys nobody can argue with data right yeah Uh, actually a lot of studies surrounding mansplaining and the fact that women are a lot less vocal and then when they are vocal they're more likely to be interrupted Mm -hmm. so one study said that both men and women interrupt women more often than they interrupt men and um, so this is a study done by George Washington University, and they put um, 20 women and 20 men in, in pairs and then recorded and transcribed their conversations. Men interrupt women like 2.8 times. <laughs> 2.8 <laughs> times? Only 2.8 times? <laughs> and then, so, and, but they interrupt other males less. And so uh, basically, um, if you're a woman, you're just much more likely to be interrupted by men for speaking in general. Hashtag mansplaining. And then, so then when they looked into um, a different study, basically crunched all the numbers from different studies. And then, and this one, uh, the University of California, Santa Cruz, found that men were more likely to infer women with the intent to assert dominance in the conversation. So they want, when they interrupt it, it's not to like add on, like, oh yeah, you're right, you know, like, or oh yeah, like that makes sense. They interrupt it in order to take control of the conversation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So um, again, mansplaining. <laughs> and then so uh, and then in the workplace, men dominate conversations more during meetings. And Brigham Young University and Princeton study in 2012 showed that women only spoke 25 percent of the time in professional meetings, and men took 75 percent of 
the Bizarre. conversation in an average meeting. And then the study also found people in this kind of situation thought that when they were asked, like, oh, how divided this conversation was, do you think like men and women spoke an equal amount? They always thought that they spoke an equal amount, even though... Both men and women? Yeah. Um, Both parties reckon, think that they've, yeah. they've done yeah. okay. Yeah, and this is the same in a Harvard Law School classroom study in 2004. And they, men were also uh, 50% more likely than a woman to volunteer at least one comment during class and 144% more likely to speak voluntarily at least three times. There's a double standard yeah. in conversations, everyday conversations. When we started this podcast, Sweden was very deliberate about like, tell me when to shut up. <laughs> like, exactly. Because <laughs> as a guy, I... You know, I have been given way too much space to talk yeah. whatever I want. So tell me when to shut up. <laughs> yeah, so he was like very deliberate about like also being um, like, don't mind me if you need to speak up more. And like if this is more heavy towards my voice instead of his. I'm sorry, I'm just going to be blunt about it. Mm-hmm. Maybe because you were both comfortable and that you're, you were raised in a society where everyone accepts each other. Mm-hmm. Or maybe you were... I'm, really I'm a you're a middle class or upper higher. That gives you a space. Yeah, but yeah. I have my own privileges. Yes, well, yeah. it gives That's your own point. privileges. But for some people who comes from someone with low economic background, mm-hmm. they're women who come from oppression, yeah. from how they were raised as someone who is not privileged enough, yeah. or how they were raised that you're not supposed, you're not allowed to have been Pinions, given. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. there's this pressure where women from the low economic background feel like, mm-hmm. oh, this is my fate that I should just yeah. accept it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's the kind of voices I think we need to listen yeah. to. to mm-hmm. um, also because I've had the privileges that protects me from mm-hmm. that yes. and that has valued my opinion. Mm-hmm. feminists in Indonesia, okay. Indonesia landscape for just love it. like so what are the different organizations that are around like what are their resources for women who want you know access to different kinds of groups and support I think the most progressive are the communist from one but mm-hmm. other than that that's not an NGO it's yeah. a governmental watchdog yeah and then there's also there's a lot of space for women to speak up Mm-hmm. Like Magdalene and Conde, they accept writings that comes mm-hmm. from the millennials, as we say it, but mm-hmm. not just millennials, but mm-hmm. people who think that th- there's this kind of issue in women that we forgot to speak out. Yeah, and then there's there's Lentera ID, which campaigns about um, let's talk about violence against women. Mm-hmm. They've started campaigning about it, and there's the Alliance Laki Laki Baru, which is the male feminist movement in Indonesia, which is really cool. They've done a lot of things. And there's this samsara. Samsara gives counseling to people who seek help if they're pregnant, to women mm-hmm. who seek help if they're pregnant. And they're very helpful. I can't say what they do, but they promote this safe sex education and also what to do when you're pregnant. Mm-hmm. And it's an unintended pregnancy. And then what I love the most is the voice of the artists mm-hmm. like there's a lot of collectives such as collective patina and then there's mari jeng rebut kembali mm-hmm. and then there's kartika hiahya and there's a lot more other individuals that voice out their uh, feminist views or they're they're more they're, public about they're it. more public about it in an in an artistic way which mm-hmm. i which is so empowering i'm not saying that this feminism society is close just to feminism. Yeah. If you want to be part of it, then engage in yeah. it. It's, it's not that hard. Yeah. 
mm-hmm. we're not pushing you away. I mean, I've, I've, I've had a lot of friends who doesn't know what feminism is, and I put them inside of the group, and they're like, wow, this, this is, is super like, exactly cool. like what this I've been feeling. Yes. Like, I thought I was crazy. Like, I think one no, of the most important things in feminism is like validating like all of all the subtle digs mm-hmm. that I face in mm-hmm. my life and I was like well I'm not alone you're not alone. Crazy. No one is alone like this is a thing people don't realize feminists have doubts too and like we're oh, human we like we're we have cool. bad days we have moments that we just can't even like yeah. and um, we need each other to like validate and like say like no we're right and like stick to the course and like be supportive It's good to have people who have the same kind of thoughts and the same kind of struggle we go through every day. Yeah. So that's all for this week of Daily Ika. Once again, thanks so much to Dea for uh, coming on the show and being our first official guest. As always, all links and information regarding everything we talked about will be on our website, dailyika.id. And we're also going to put in all the links for the awesome feminist organizations in Indonesia that we talked about. Use the credits to Ryan Little, Brooke for Free, and Jezzard. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe to us on Apple's podcast app or follow us on SoundCloud and like us on Facebook, Instagram. Also, we'd love to hear from you. If you have any topic suggestions, please message us on Facebook or email us at dialogicapodcast at gmail.com. Also, if you have any questions or burning desires or anything that we can maybe give you advice about, um, please send us that as well because we'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening.